All right, YouTube, this is PlayStation Repair Augusta doing another stream, doing something a little different. We're going to kind of pull out a throwback that we've got. I don't get these too often, and to be completely upfront, they are probably not worth getting fixed in comparison to buying used. You can find them on eBay and other places much cheaper than you can probably get them repaired. However, if you're one of those that desires to have a device fixed knowing that it doesn't have pre-existing issues, um, that it was put back together by a professional, then that may be a reason to go ahead and spend the extra to make sure it's a device that lasts. And there's still plenty of fun to be had from this cons console, but this is a Nintendo 2DS, which is quite dated in the world of electronics where seems like things are rapidly changing, especially in Nintendo's mobile gaming platforms. They are constantly rolling out something new. It's almost like they try to follow the cell phone market of let's see if we can launch a device every single year, and they do so by just changing little nuances to it. So what we have here, and before we get going, I want to say what I'm about to do, I probably don't recommend just because there are some side effects that can result from this, but to show you what problem we're having here, if you see this on your own, this is what we have going on. We've got a cracked screen. Now some people may be thinking, oh, you can just replace the top, but no, you can see here, clearly broken on the bottom as well, but there's a caveat to this. There is not a top and bottom. Yes, there's two screens, but they are one. So this is what you will need to replace. Now, I'm not sure if you can hear that. The volume is fairly faint on this thing, but it's volume and responding. It's doing everything that it should. We're going to go ahead and turn it off now, just because I have seen mostly on the 3DS that when you have badly damaged screens there is a potential for trying to run it with a cracked screen causing some overheating issues in the cable assemblies and it's actually resulted in melted connectors and I've seen this happen about two or three times and it, I just I haven't bothered to troubleshoot the why I just know that it's something that has popped up to me, two, three times, what do they say? Once is an accident, twice is a coincidence, three times a pattern. So we at least have the bare minimum for a pattern. What we want to do first, though, in replacing the screen is we need to go through disassembly. And to do that, we're going to take the screws from the back of this device, where we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six screws that we need to remove just from this area. There will be some additional screws that we'll find. And again, like I said, I don't get these all the time now. There was a moment in time where these were just all you would see, but that has passed. So I may stumble and have to look and kind of re-educate myself. Now it looks like we have a handy customer fix here for making, that's actually a little ingenious idea in a smart way. I guess their pin was constantly falling out. We got a MacGyver on our hands. I wrapped a little tape around it just to give it some wedge and that made it so it wouldn't fall out so easily. Now one of these is going to expose our battery. So if you're looking to change out your battery, you can see that through this video as well. Now I decided to do this because I wanted to go back in time and kind of pull out some of these devices that I really do recommend customers to attempt DIY on them. I don't think that they're overly complicated. They're easy enough to achieve on your own. And by doing so, and save the labor of going to a repair shop. Now on 3DSs, 
I, I really, I just don't recommend it. It's, I don't even want to do them, but I do because we want to make our customers happy, but they are a pain. They're a pain in the butt. They're a pain in the wallet because taking them apart and putting them back together can result in torn cables to parts that weren't broken to begin with. And then the worst one ever was the very first one I found out about the melted cable connector on where I took it apart, put it back together, took it apart, put it back together. Couldn't figure out for life of me what was wrong. Everything tested good. Put the screen in another device. It worked well. All was good. And it was just being trolled by, actually I think our top here is our battery. I think that's the ones where the screws don't come out all the way. And when you start to take this apart, you will realize that there's all kind of oil and skin and whatever else from having our hands on this for so long. And I do recommend cleaning that out as you're going through this. You're going to see if this decides to participate or if it's going to be a butt. It's probably going to be a butt. Uh, in addition to taking that out, we should probably also remove all of our little I believe these do not come out until we actually have it open and removed and then there will be screws that mount down there Yeah, there we go. I will say the edge on this is impressively smooth. And all right, so now we're getting to see some additional things going on here. We've got a little bit of gook, and that's the only way to describe it. You can see it as it hits that light. I've got a bit of reflection on my screen, but we've got some ink that is sticking in here, and that is probably something like soda. It's not as, it's got a little sticky to it. Not as sticky as I would think for, so, oh yeah, that's sticky. Sometimes you just got to smell it. It does smell a little sugary, so I'm going to say that was soda. And that part, just so that it doesn't stick to anything and make something else on the desk gross. I'm going to go ahead and clean that. And this is why I don't just charge... You know, some people say, oh, well, you know, can't you just do it and throw it together? No, one, you've got to go through all the steps like everybody else, which is time consuming. And then two, you always run into something else. And when you start doing things cheap, then you run into situations where you go, well, I'm not going to clean this. And I just, if I'm going to do the job, let's do it right. So you charge the set rate based on estimated time involved, just like an automotive mechanic would. They have a book that tells them how long it should take to do something, and they price by the hour based on that book. And then their goal is to get it done faster than that, and that's how they're able to increase their revenue. I know about how long this will take. My goal is to always get it done quicker, and it probably will take me longer because we're doing the video. Well, that's okay because we're doing two things at once. We're killing two birds with one effort. We're not going to throw any stones because that's probably not PC, bro. Man, there was, yeah, there was quite a bit of little side gook in here. That's official now, side gook. Movie industry has side boob. The repair industry has side gook. This makes you want to watch more of those videos, doesn't it? All right, that's good enough for now. 
let's see, we need to go down into, and this is where we get a little more screw intensive. So before we took out four screws and we put those up in our little tray, we've got a little tray bin here, you can't really see it, but they're in a little silicone tray being held down, or held in place, I should say. And now we're going to start removing the rest of these screws, and we want to put them in a separate, although I think the screws are going to be the same on this model until we get down into the circuit board side, but we're going to put those internal screws into a separate collector or bin or holder or whatever we want to call it. And that just will allow us to better keep track of what came from where so we can stage our reassembly and not have to kind of fumble around and look at screws to tell the difference between A and B. For the most part, and every now and then, especially on cell phones, you'll have different screws on same layer levels. So it's a little bit harder to isolate without getting one of those marked bins where they have you put every screw in its own slot. But for this, my experience is that pretty much all of the Nintendos, you have the same screw set as you go down layer by layer and rarely does it adjust and if it does it's pretty self-explanatory where the changes were so now that that's been done you lift up and always whenever you're lifting something whether you're familiar with it or not you don't just pull and yank. You want to be slow and you want to be deliberate. The reason being is this. We've got a flex cable and that flex cable can be easily damaged and what we want to do is make sure that it comes out for us in the same condition it was put in by a manufacturer through assembly. Now you notice that I changed tweezers and you know, if you don't have all the different sets of tweezers, I'm using like duckbill tweezers here. You don't need to have a bunch of different ones, but it is helpful. And you don't want to use these fine point tweezers on it unless these have a curve and I could have got into it, but having the duckbills, I wanted to show those just because it would be a little bit better for people to see that it's it's recommended that you have a fair amount of left to right support. So if you use just a thin tip, you're going to break something. Use something a little wider and preferably the closer you can get it to the width of that, the better. You'll be able to push in and snap up without having any damage to this connector. We're going to sit those off to the side. And then our next step will be, unless whoop, we're already having stuff come out on us, let's move up. Alright, so we're going to pull these out. Notice you've got springs that are on these, and that is what is pushing back when you go to click that button and then it springs back up so it's not constantly pressing your button. You then have your little slide switch which goes in on this side. Oh, it comes with gook in this. This thing has definitely been used well. Which nothing wrong with that. It just means whoever has it really likes it because they get their use out of it. It's got miles on it. For the sake of making things easy for yourself, you probably want to try to keep things in the position of how they go. This will allow you for when you're putting it back together to not have to think about where things are going. You know where they're going. And I don't believe this is necessary to remove, but for the purpose of the video, we're just going to go ahead and be proactive. It may very well have to be removed. But we're going to take it out just to show it's disassembly because we said full teardown. 
All right, we're going to put those in a separate bin. And we're going to lift this up so that we can look inside. All right, we still got some resistance there, so I think we're going to have to remove the board before that will fully come out. Which is why I thought we didn't have to take that off to get the board out, but we're going to anyway. So now these screws, again, we want to put in a separate bin. We're going to put them over and off to the right. If you have a magnetic mat, which I do, I just don't feel like using it. It takes up extra space left to right for while we're doing this video. You can place them on a mat, which is pretty good to hold them in position, as well as most of the little part mats that they sell are meant to be marked on with a dry erase marker. And so you can actually write beside it. This goes for this. This grouping of screws is for so-and-so. And I do recommend them. They're very helpful. I guess like anything comes practice, because in the beginning I really needed to use stuff like that. When I started out with cell phones, I needed those mats that told me where all the screws were. And then as you get more familiar with disassembly and reassembly of electronics in general, you start to be able to better sort through those differences even if they're misplaced. All right, we just about got all the screws removed. And the upside to having the video is that we'll be able to go back and look at this video should we forget something and go, where did that go? Or we've got a hole with no screw in it. We can go back and look at the video, pinch in on a zoom and go, okay, nothing actually did go there or something did. All right, and now these, again, they're small. We've got a fair amount of distance away from them. You don't have to use a microscope, but one, it'll be a better show of what we're looking at. And two, it'll make sure that we're getting in and not causing any stress to the, um, the connectors. And let's go ahead, we're going to switch over to Scope Big. You get to really see some of the crud that's coming out of this thing now. Look at that. I don't know what that is. It's just like oil and skin that's built up in the cracks. It kind of looks like boogers. You'll find some gross stuff in electronics. One of these days I may do some, some repairs just to highlight some of the grossies. All right, so we're going to, one, get ourselves a little bit better of focus. And then now with this one, it's small enough that you can go ahead and just use any tweezer you want. We're not worried about the duck bill. And we just want to gently pry up. Once that's done, I do recommend, again, using tweezers for this. You want to be very careful with removing that. You just kind of slide in from the back and 
I like to keep my finger over the top of it to help as you're pulling backwards to kind of assist it staying down because if it lifts up as you're pulling out, it tends to like to hang on by its hinge. And when it does that, you could potentially rip the cable. And I say you could potentially, it, it, that really just depends on how much force you're using. First time around, you probably will use too much force. So put your finger down. See how that goes, how it lifts up? We want to straighten that out and come back. We could even pull in our duck bills for this. All right, now this one I think is a tricky one. It looks like it goes one way, but it goes the other. I believe this one, yep, lifts up here. Not bad, I don't think I've done one of these in a couple of months. And memory still serves fairly well. Where else do we have connectors? So we've got, and I'm gonna review these back on the screen as we get further along, just to highlight all of the ones that had to be pulled out. Okay, so here again, we're back to the original style, which is where we pull from that side. So all of these we pulled from the gray. On the one before this, we pulled from the black. And then we've got just two more. And these are our big ones. Now for the big ones, we want to go back to our duckbill. And I'm sure there's a different name for these, but that's what I'm going to call it. And look at this. These are actually really long. So they're not even responding well to that. So let's go ahead and we're going to change tools to this guy. I'm not worried about hurting these flex cables because this is going on to the screen and we're replacing that screen. So the cables I don't care about. These other cables down at the bottom that we did before I do care about. However, these we do not, but we do not want to break the black tabs and we don't want to break the housing underneath them because if we break those, they're going to need to be replaced. And now you probably at that point should definitely just go and buy a replacement. All right, so whoop, let's put that back because I should have switched screens again, which, oh, you can still see it in a little corner video, but I'm going to go ahead and switch back to our Logi Big. We're going to move this camera over and out of the way. And we've got now the board able to lift, we're not held back by any cables or screws, and we're able to just slide this right off. And I think we still would have had to unscrew that because we wouldn't have been able to lift this out, I don't think. Although, no, we probably could have lifted it out bottom first and then slid back, and that should have worked. All right, but let's go ahead and let's recap what we did here, just so that it's clear for everybody. We've got down at our bottom, we have one, two, three, three ribbon cable connectors, actually called flex cable connectors. We have two large that go directly to the LCD. And if you look at your LCD, you can see that there is a third cable, which should be, I believe it is this one here, is that cable going to the screen. But I may be wrong. Let's lift up and see what we got. And there was the one other cable up top, which was this one. And I was right. We've got this cable right here goes to the screen. So again, we're going to sit this board off to the side. 
on the bottom side, I just felt it flick off. Look at this. We've got rubbers. These are our contact pads for our controls. And I noticed that because we had one fall off. So we want to make sure that we hang on to these, that we don't lose them. And I'm not sure if it's clear in this picture, but there's more of that kind of debris flaking throughout this device on this side. And that is something that we probably want to treat before we put it all back together. What we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and lift. Actually, I was thinking that this was not overlapping, but it is, and that should have made sense from when I looked at it. So we do need to go ahead and remove the joystick. And what we're going to do is we're going to put these two screws, which they're easily noticed from all the others. They're silver instead of black or gold, and they're much longer because they need to go deeper in. But they're going to go in their own bin, and they're going to go with the joystick, and there's an insulator that just kind of helps it to glide so that they're not having plastic on plastic friction on some rough surfaces that is probably plastic as well, but it gives them a nice smooth surface to glide on. So now with that out, we should be able to just pop this screen out. Now if this screen wasn't cracked, you may want to be more gentle with it. But because the screen itself is what we're trying to fix by replacing it, we can just get rid of this little guy here. Now, one other thing and something that I forgot, which I think I have some of these in stock already anyway, is that this is just your screen. There is touch to this. Uh, definitely there is touch to this, but it's not built in to the screen like on other devices it is actually built in to a separate piece and we're just going to leave that piece there. The top screen doesn't have any of that so you don't have to worry about it but the bottom screen does need to be free of defect and for this model the damage appears to be strictly with the display it does not look like we have any damage to this touch but if we get it back together and we notice we're getting random touch issues guess what we're taking it back apart we're putting it in there. So if I had had this part already pulled out and organized, I probably would have just replaced it. But that's not what we're going to do today. We've already started the video. We're going to get it done. Being fairly confident that that part is good to go. And if I have to then come back and do it again, well, that's on me for going half-ass. All right, now we're looking to see what has popped out and what hasn't. There it goes. We had a button pop out. We're actually going to remove this button anyway, or these buttons anyway. Just makes it easier to clean this up. We don't want this crud in the buttons because it will get on our contact pads eventually, and it could interfere with that connection. These are keyed and slotted, so you can't put them back in the wrong position, so you don't really need to be too concerned about that part of it. What you do need to be concerned about is that you don't lose any of them, which right now we've got one that's MIA, but I think it's probably stuck inside. Up oh, here it is. There we go. So it was stuck inside one of the pads, and that fell out, or I'd already pulled and separated it and just forgot about it. So... We get our magic tool that does most of our cleaning in this industry, i.e. a Q-tip and some isopropyl. And we're going to hook this thing up. We're going to make sure that it sparkles with the group. Uh, another way to clean this would be to pop it in the ultrasonic. But 
But then we have to worry about water and the joints and crevices, cricks, cracks, crooks and crannies. And that's where you hate to be all business, but time is money. And being able to take that luxury with this device is just not cost effective. So what we do is we refurbish it in the most cost effective way as possible. But like I said, not skipping steps or not completely throwing a blind eye to the steps. Now, I wouldn't call it skipping either by cleaning this way versus using an ultrasonic. One, most people watching this video aren't going to have an ultrasonic cleaner. And if you do, good for you. Go ahead, throw it in there. And then, because it's plastic and you can't bake it, you're going to need to clean this or let this dry. And you can use some type of warming, but I believe that the temperature needs to stay below and I'd have to check my plastic temps for whatever type of plastic this is made out of. I do not believe it's any type of special high temp plastic. But you're going to need to allow it to dry for probably if it's air drying. I wouldn't even put it out in the sun. Sun can very easily warp plastic, especially when it's been separated like this. Um, if you're in the south where we are in Georgia, I mean, it gets hot enough to just warp this thing like crazy. So you could, let's see, what are some home-based ways to dry it out other than just air dry? A blow dryer, hair dryer. Don't use a hot air gun. You will melt this. A blow dryer on a low setting would get the job done probably quite nicely. I would still probably give it another day, 24 hours after blow drying it to know that it was just fully clear and clean of any moisture. And do I still have my rocket ship up here? I don't think I've ever used that on video. Oh, there it is. I could use compressed air, but I think that's probably a little bit too violent for this. We're going to end up blowing parts all around. I bought this some years ago. And I use it off and on. It's kind of it's kind of handy. I mean, it, it does what it's supposed to do. It's not overly complicated. It doesn't require power other than me squeezing it. And it gets the job done. And you can't really ask for much more. I mean, you can ask for tons more. You can ask for the world if you want, but within the confines of this, that's probably all you need. Now, to have it in rocket ship form where it sits up, I bought it on AliExpress from some Chinese vendor. I think it might have been... 10 to 12 bucks. Giottos. G I O T T O S. Giottos. Patented, but no patent number. So I highly doubt that it has a patent. But I just like the fact that it stood up because I have another one and it rolls around and disappears. This one tends to stay where you stick it. All right. Now what you just saw me put back in was a washer, kind of like a, a little just an insulator where the speaker sits on top of. And then, oh, I knocked him over. I grab. Just cleaning these off. And it's going to need to probably be cleaned again before we go through full reassembly. But I want to clean that up now a little bit. I'm going to move this over to the side. And then we're going to get rid of all that gook that has now been popped off of this. We're going to do that by throwing away some of these dirty Q-tips and cloths that we just used. 
We're going to move some of these parts to their outer edges. But this one I think will fit nicely on that little socket. And this will pop off just like that. Sometimes I don't bother cleaning the area, but this stuff, mm -mm, not one, I don't really trust it because it looks like boogers. So I don't want to be rolling my fingers around on it. Number two is that because it's so small and um, easily caught by air is that just drafts in the room could cause it to um, to blow back onto the interior, which is what we just spent all that time cleaning it to not have. All right. And then when we're done with that little nap wipe, we throw it away because it's got all that garbage on it. We don't want to reuse that. All right. Now, we can bring back this guy. Oh, and I think I threw away that one a little too quick because you know what? We didn't clean. Look at how quick stuff tries to pop out on you. Sometimes, most of the time, these just stay in here. And these are just little retaining pins that help line things up. And that pops back into this one. And the other one I'm not 100% sure on. And I want to say they both went there, but I'm probably, I guess one went here. I thought the other one went there, but we're going to need to check that. All right. And I may be wrong on both of them because that one feels like it's way more stuck than it previously was. We already had some of that gook that had made its way to the front of this screen. And so I'm just getting that off now. And for whatever reason right now, the aftermarket for you know retro, and this isn't really retro, this is more like I said, a throwback is that, and that that market is popping off. So there's a lot of people that are proactively wanting to save and recondition their devices um, for the idea that one day it may be worth something. Now, once they get scratched and scuffed, we know that its collectability is far away depleted. But in the gaming industry, it seems to be that um, even scratched and scuffed, they are retaining some value on the really rare games Specifically, it looks like in the early Nintendo and, and SNES days. Mint is still king, but somewhere, and let's call it patina, that authentic look is, is acceptable and even in some cases desirable as it validates the legitimacy of it in a world that has clones like everything else. All right, so now we're getting ready for our screen placement. We just want to make sure we've got this as clean as we can get it. This is where the lint-free wipes really come into play, which is what these Chemtex wipes are that I'm using now. Having that lint-free wipe is going to make sure that as you're wiping, you're not laying down new problems. You're actually just removing everything that's there. And sometimes these still give you issues, and it's not because of the wipe. It's because of the stuff that they pick up with this little gummy on the side, which luckily this doesn't really use that. Then it gets stuck to the wipe, and then it transfers on to those parts of the glass that you don't want it to do.
Look at that, it already tried to get away from me. We're going to hit it with air again, and that just makes sure that any dust that has blown in there is no longer there. Now remember, the orientation of our screen was like this. We know that because we remember this cable was down here. I like to blow that air on it until that last moment where it's seated into its little socket. And what else do we have? All right, so now we want to check this board out. We want to look for any debris, uh, any components that may be damaged. We're just going to kind of visually examine it. Again, you're not going to have a microscope if you're trying this, so use your eyes. Use your brain, look to see if anything looks outside of the norm, and if it doesn't, you should be good to go. There's a little bit of buildup of that crud that's in this. You're probably not going to have a brush that would work well for that, but if you find yourself a very... If you've watched my other videos, you know I have these brushes where I've snipped the ends. These are just horsehair brushes. Now, if you don't like the idea that I'm using horsehair brushes, I don't know what to tell you. These are probably the best thing you could use. If you think that I'm running outside and snatching the horsehair off of the horse, causing it harm and pain, then yes, you are right. That is exactly how those are made. Now, I say that in jest, but what we found out about the Internet is that... <laughs> People will get in an uproar over some crazy stuff. Alright, so I don't think that where I have that little pin placed is actually where it went. So, as I said, document where things go, and we've done so by using the video. You will save yourself time and headache. later in your reassembly process by having these things kind of mapped out. And to be honest with you, a picture would have been much more helpful to take in the beginning rather than having to fast forward and rewind a video feed. Now what I'm doing now is I'm reaching behind this device in order to feed those cables through. Because obviously, if we didn't do that, we wouldn't be able to connect them. So if you're wondering why that was done, the answer is obviously. That is an official answer. It's in a handbook somewhere on how to repair electronics. So basically, we just kind of wiggle, finagle, contort and twist. Don't twist, don't contort. Wiggle and finagle and finesse your parts into place. I probably shouldn't joke about things like that because then people take it serious and they get mad when they break something because you were being funny and you told them something that you thought they would get the sarcasm on and it just didn't come through. 
All right, so as you saw that, I, I put this in place first because from experience, I found that's the easiest way to get this back in because what holds it in place is being screwed down at the bottom. Well, if it's not screwed in and you go and try to put it on this and then slide it in and make it work, it just falls off. So you want to do exactly as I just did. You want to put it in, lift it up, and then slide it into position. And then you should hear it click. And once it's done that, then you can go back through and mount your screws. And we're going to go ahead and put these two screws in because what it will help us do is secure this board for this 2DS into position so that we can do some basic functional testing. And once we confirm that it works as we imagined it would, or I better should say as it was intended to, then we can go through the full reassembly process. All right, so one, two, that's it. That's all we're putting in is two screws. We've got one, two, three, four, five ribbon cables. There is a six, if you remember, which requires us to have the washer. Now, a lot of times I test it without this in. It is okay to do that. Putting this back in, I will say, by the naked eye is a bit of a pain. It's not impossible, but it is a pain. So we're now going to go ahead and switch over. For the benefit of my ease and your visual entertainment, we're going to switch over to the scope. Plus, we'll still have the overhead cam view. And we're going to try to put this in without muffing it up. And there may have been one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I see I've got, yeah, because I took that off in the very beginning without doing my count. So there's actually seven connectors. Luckily, I caught that before you got further along because if that messed you up or you missed this part of the video and you're going back trying to figure out what cable goes there, my B. Oh, we're going to do that again because it wasn't quite, and this is where, and the more I use this, the more it makes me want to buy that other camera. All right, so I think we're all the way in, but I don't think we're all the way in. But we're going to go ahead and try it out. Yes, we were all the way in to begin with. There was a visual area where you could see on this kind of like a, a stop, but I couldn't tell if that was a stop that we were supposed to stop at or if it was one that just kind of like slides over and kind of lifts the cable up for better contact. but it was the former rather than the latter. All right, so these can be tricky sometimes. You have a, a again, everything is keyed, which is really nice because it makes it where things click into place and you don't have to worry about, did you get it to fit right? You know, because otherwise it won't install problem is, is getting that particular one lined up sometimes can just be a pain. In that case, not a big issue. All right, so now we want to go down to our little lower cable connectors here. And remember, this one that we're doing now was on the actual LCD screen. I believe this is probably power, if memory serves correctly.
And actually this one, no, this is our touch. This is our digitizer. So our touch cable is the clear one, which you can't even see in the video. Oh my goodness, why is my camera so stupid right now? All right, so this one, this bottom one right here, this is our digitizer. A little screen that we didn't remove that does touch, that's what that is. This is probably power, and it even says P12, makes me think power. You still can't see it. There it goes. Now it's not hiding. You clear that up a little bit. This is our power for our LCD display. And we just folded it over, popped it in, and we're going to lock that gate where it's at. I'm trying to make this the most complete repair video for this device out there with overhead, full visualization, as well as the microscope with the close-up. Alright, so this cable I don't remember, but I see that it goes to something, probably camera. It's only two wires, so that may be power as well. And also says 1P14. All right, so that might actually be our power button. Is that what that is? Yeah, that's a button. So that's why it's just two wire. That is a power button. So far left on the bottom is power button. And then we've got ribbon cables for the display. Can we, we can zoom out. Why did I not do that earlier? So we've got two of these, and this is, it's upside down because my camera is inverted right now. I need to get that back adjusted. I forget why I moved something around and jacked my camera. All right, but see what we're doing here? We're not forcing this cable. Let's do that again. I'm going to try to get a better, better shot. I keep moving the device, I should just be moving the camera. Duh. Alright, it says this. Yes, this is the cable, the one I wanted to begin with. Alright, so we don't want to force this. We don't want to bend it. We don't want to tear it. We want to align it. And this is where a microscope becomes really handy because seeing what you're doing by the naked eye is a little bit less obvious. But for the purpose of demonstrating, it provides an excellent opportunity to show you a fair amount of detail in the insertion. So once this cable is in there, that is probably how I recommend you do it. You want to get pressure moving forward, but not applying so much pressure that you're bending that cable. And you probably won't kill it if you bend it. In fact, you're most likely not going to. You would have to do something really muffed up to uh, to cause damage to that just by bending it. Ribbon cables can do that, but you can bend them too much. Like let's say you flex them backwards and forwards, you would eventually break those traces inside of it. So as a rule of thumb, it is better to not bend them because you're not going to apply, what kind of force would that be? I mean, I wouldn't think it would be a shearing force. It would just be a it's like snapping the cable by bending it. Take a paper clip and bend it backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, end to end, over, over and over again. Eventually, the metal will snap. Ah, oh, look at that. See, I was down below. This is where we want to be. We want to be sitting up on top. That one sits higher than the other one. This is actually a, a thicker seat than this one. This is a low profile, this is a standard profile. All right, and that is it. That is in. Notice we got a nice little, little hump, little slide there. 
That is how it should look, at least in my opinion. Now that that is done, we can skip back to our Logibig only. Ah, uh, this is what the camera was our other cable that was yada yada. Okay. We're going to blow this back piece off. We're going to do that away from the parts that we just cleaned. Now, yes, I know, I've got tons of stuff to still put on, but we're just testing here. We want to get ourselves lined up so that we can see what's going on and that we've got power to the screen and that everything is working as it should. I've even done this without putting this piece on. You can do it that way. It's just a little awkward, and so I'm not going to teach people to do it that way in this video. All right, so we're going to sit this down so that we can get a straight-on approach from this. I'm not going to use the microscope. I'm going to do it exactly the way you would if you were having to do it at home and did not have a microscope. So if I struggle, feel free to laugh because I have been spoiled by having a scope to make this much easier. This is the area where you want to be careful. When you have one that doesn't like to close, you want to find something, again, that can cover that length so that you're not prying at it or you're not pushing all in one position. And then I'm looking down at this that I can see by my eye there is some debris in between some of these pins, and I don't like it. So. We're going to pull in this scope. I don't think that it would cause any detriment here, but just so that you can see what I'm looking at. This is what I noticed by my eye, and it's less obvious now that I've kind of pushed on it with these tweezers. All right, so we are going to use the scope because I think closing it has caused that piece to go there we go piece is still there it's part of that gook so our side gook has kind of decided to uh, to travel alright I'm not going to be any more rough with this because this is a good opportunity to nitpick something that is probably not going to cause any issue and you're going to end up pulling a pin and, and that's game over for the day at least. Alright, so notice, let's get this back out of the way. Let's go, there we go. So notice I've just slapped the back on, I'm just using it as a brace and a retainer for the battery. All the other stuff is still disconnected. Now from that, we're going to put our battery in. And I probably should have thought that through. Oh, wait a minute. Power button is, that's why I did not do it. Power button does not require it was a click button. All 
Now, at the moment, we are not seeing a power on event. So the question is, is why? And there are several different issues that can cause that, and we're going to check each of them now. Uh, I think that's the problem. There we go. Do we get a full screen? So what we had was our sleep button was actually pressed in the process of... What are we getting there? Okay, so this works. Let's get our pin. So this should be the only area where we have touch. This there, I'm a little bit wondering about this. Notice how this is spinning super fast. It's almost like we're getting <coughs> some off signal from our controller here. Let's we'll see if it spins up again or does it stay put. No, I think we're good. We might have had a little... Oh, there it goes. It's going fast again. But that might just be the interactions. On the 3DS, that's usually because this joystick is way out of uh, alignment, and it's causing it to believe that it has tension on it. And, in fact, I do feel... It feels like it has tension where it, it shouldn't and some slop where it shouldn't. But I don't see it moving down here. Let's see if we can find a game. Detective Pikachu, no, we don't. Let's let's do this. No. All right, to further test it, I'm going to have to get a better assembly going on, so we're going to have to put more of this together. But at this point, we know screen works, touch screen works. It, everything seems to be functioning fine, but this slow down spin up of this, again, it's been a while. I can't remember if that is particular to it. Not the case for the um, 3DS. So we want to check and just make sure that we're giving them back a fully functional device. All right, so we want to go ahead now and power down. And press that home button. Hang on, let's hold. I might be being an idiot. Power off. Home button to return. Okay. Do as we say, not as we do. Even those that have done it before make mistakes. So press the power button, then touch the screen pad to turn off, not press the home button to turn off after pressing the power button. And that at least gets us to where we can kind of start to approach some final steps here. So we pull the battery out. Pop this back off, and notice again I did use the duck bills because we wanted that larger surface area so that we didn't break that. Man, I don't know what is going on back here, but it got warm.
All right, now that we know that we have what we believe to be a fully functional board with no issues, and we are going to check that controller alignment before we get too crazy here, but we can go ahead and pop this back off, and then Because we've already gone through all this, I'm just going to do it the way that I would if I was not making a video. Notice that as I mentioned before, I leave that controller on and I can just move that entire assembly over until we're ready for it. At this point now, we're going to start putting buttons back in that we don't have crud disease on. In fact, let's, let's look at these just to make life easier for us. And I take that back. These all have crud so just cleaning that up, that is a B button, which should go somewhere. There. And we've got a Y button. Thinking about this backwards always confuses you. Or at least it always confuses me. All right. Hey. Oh, I was right the first was I right the first time? Or was I wrong the first time? Maybe the second time. Yeah, I was wrong both times. What the heck's wrong with me? All right. Gets easier as you get more buttons in because then you have less options to choose from. All right, so this is our A button and we are there. And then our B button, or not our B button, our X button. We are there. And then one thing I like about what Nintendo has done is they never mark these buttons, so they're interchangeable. You don't have to worry about getting them in their right slot. And then this is really cruddy. In fact, look at this. I mean, there's like debris that is popping off onto this. Hang on, it's nothing against the owner of this device. They may watch this video, which everybody that has kids knows that uh, they can get sticky and they can get messy, and then they transfer that to whatever they're interacting with. But for the age of this device, what you're seeing there is what you would expect. Now, I have done work on one of these for the customer before. Maybe it's a 3DS. So this is a repeat customer. 
But if I did clean this, then that means in between now and then, all of that was added in because this would have been cleaned out before. But I don't think that this particular unit had been in for service. So as long as that is like from original, then that's an ordinary amount of, of crud. Like I said, a lot of that is probably dead skin cells that just accumulate inside of the device from having your hands on it. Dead skin cells and oil. And again, you don't have to have that in any particular order. Now these look the same, but they are not the same. They need to go back on where they're supposed to go on. First though, we want to clean them. We're going to put a little isopropyl on them, inside them, however you want to call it. And we're just going to clean these up. Because buttons are probably part, or one of the most important parts in your console. Your buttons don't work, it doesn't work. There's no point in having a fixed console with gunked up buttons that can't send your signals through. And yes, this is not the part that makes the signal, but having gunk on that side eventually results in having gunk on this side. So, we clean both. Now, these are what we call doped pads. These have been doped with a carbon coating that allows to make an electrical connection when they're pushed against the copper contacts that you saw on that other side. And here I am trying to put it in backwards. Well, rever well swapped. This is for the D-pad, small and fat. That's the D-pad. Uh, yes, he is well fed because he is a fat boy that does not like to get in place. And that statement may not be PC either, but sue me. All right. Now, the good thing is, oh, and let's do something else. You'll go through a lot of Q-tips doing repairs. We're going to take a fresh Q-tip, and we're going to use it to clean the eyepiece for the camera. Try to give that front-facing camera a nice, clear viewport so that it can see your pretty smile when you go to play your games. All right, I almost forgot to put on two more of these, which are here. And these are going to go, remember, black contact, those doped pads. Those need to be facing up. And then on this pad, there is no coating. Correct, no coating. It just is a pressure contact. And it goes in a particular way. Look at the display and you'll see the way that it goes. This one does not want to get on its part. It slides in like it wanna goes this way, but it's shaped like it goes the other way. There we go. Just had to, again, finagle it until we figured out that order. So round side down, flat side up, that puts you back to the way it needs to be. So that little guy there will help with probably what has confused some plenty. All right. Now we're going to take this guy back. We lost something. Always check. This likes to stick to the speaker, then it likes to fall off. Always look inside and then look on the speaker. Make sure that little insulating gasket is there. 
it'll just help you get a nice, more clear, kind of defined sound out of that speaker hole because it's it's sealed up. All right, now again, same as last time, we're going to reach in underneath and we're going to carefully lift these pads up and into that pocket and then we're going to slap it back down. So you do everything careful and then you slap it back down. So we lift it up, we slid it in, and at that point then we can just kind of get our wiggle on. Although we expect to have some resistance here, I almost feel like we got a little, oh, that feels good. And then right here, though, I feel like I'm getting more than I should. Yeah. Aha. I already see what the problem is. So something wasn't aligned. I could feel it. Sometimes you got to trust your gut in these and say something doesn't feel right. Don't keep squeezing. Don't keep forcing. Lift. Look at that. It's stuck. I don't know if you can see this. So yeah, it's stuck to the board, which it will happen. That's fine. So we want to try to get this down in one go. So we're going to do something a little bit different this time. Rather than trying to seat it while it's laying against this because it's pushing the buttons back, which is making that make contact before it's fully locked in. We're going to go ahead I'm going to be looking at the back of my head for a second. Alright, so we're going to get that in place. We're going to pull this up and out. We're going to take this this time, and we're going to go ahead and situate it, and then we click everything in. And you know what? That is the better way to go about it. Don't do what I did last time, and don't let that happen. So before this gets away from me again, we're going to seal this sucker up on just the top two screws like we did before. You should feel a little bit of pressure against this logic board but you shouldn't feel a lot of pressure and you shouldn't feel a hump which is what I felt last time and then look at me saying make sure everything fits in snugly and then guess what I didn't make sure that everything fits in the way it should I don't know why but it just got hot in this room and I think that's starting to mess with my ability to focus here So I'm not going to stop to check it, but I've been sweating. I had to wipe my head like two separate times. I know it's hot outside, but temp is set to 73 right now. So it should be nice and cool in here. We're not doing any soldering. Alright, so the speaker kept trying to pop out of where it was supposed to be. It just wanted to be a butt is basically what it came down to. So we're going to get this clip locked in in its little retaining position. We're going to shove our Wi-Fi antenna down into its little recess there. And again, everything should fit kind of snug and kind of secure. So this shouldn't have wobble to it. It should just be kind of clipped in. All 
really don't you be a butthead. We're probably going, all because that speaker wanted to not play along. We're going to fix this rather than take it back apart. And this is where your tweezers come in. All right, so we push it, or we flip it back over, and we want to see flushness of all the buttons. And when we actuate these buttons, they should have that kind of feel that we expect. I feel like that side may need some tweaking. All right. So we still got a few tweaks to make to those pads. I don't know why they're being so stubborn. Like I said, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. When you're recording, the odds are not in your favor. I don't know why, but that is just how it seems to work. And it's always on reassembly. Disassembly, never an issue. Reassembly, if there's going to be a problem, that's where it's going to happen. All right. And so what we have now is we're trying to get this power button out that's flex cable. But we don't want to, you know, we don't want to pull on it. We don't want to tug on it. So I got an extra tool and, again, finagled it out so that we had it, had it where we needed it without forcing it to comply. Because compliance will be rewarded. So what we're doing now is we're getting the switch in place for our, um, that was the one that prevented us from powering on earlier. That is our, uh, our sleep switch. Not sure if, I think my hand is, is it covering? Yeah, my hand's covering it up. So our sleep switch, what I did was I actually, I took this and I fed it through the bottom. And again, trying to make a comprehensive guide. So we're going to show this because my hand was covering it up. Sleep switch, just like this. Pump, make it, uh, it's like a mustache, frown, whatever you want to call it. Put it in there. That button side should be exposed back. And then it just should slap right in. And then you want to make sure that you actuate that button from right to left, that it's making good contact and it's controlling that switch. I guess this is the other part that gets you in trouble with videos is in order to show things that may have gotten missed originally by the camera, you, you lift and reshow and create a new opportunity for something to come out of place. All right. All right, I like that fit a lot better. I think I'm happy with that fit. And that's bottom line is that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to go have to go off your instinct. Does it feel like it fits properly? And if it does, lock it in. If it doesn't, take a step back and try it again. All right, so again, we're going to put these cables in just like you would. You're going to do it by eye.
We're going to snap them in. And again, we're using by eye, so I can't see this as well as I could before. But there's enough details that show when it's good and when it's not. So I've done the one on the far or in the middle. I've done the one on the far left. I'm now going to do the one on the right, which is our display power cable. If I got that right, and I'm pretty sure that I have. All right, now remember, we bend all of the motherboard screws together. So we're going to pull from that bin now, and we're going to start filling in these slots. And we don't want to start tightening down on them. We just want to get a few in, in the order. And I believe they're even numbered. I'm not sure if they... No, I think those numbers may just correspond to other... Well, I don't know. Some of these really look like they're numbered. And we also have those two straight pins to figure out their exact positions. Probably need to change my screw head. It's like we're not getting the best fit possible there. Now, where the screws go, it's typically marked on the board with a circle around it. You can see that clearly, although you'd probably see it better under the microscope, but it's, it's visible in this video. The key to not having to redo all of your work is in checking as you go. If you're doing this to start your own repair business, then eventually you're going to want to make a worksheet that tells yourself or reminds yourself or anyone you employ when to stop and do a test. And at this moment, I feel good about how we're seated on the board itself. I think before we get too many more screws in, it's probably a good idea to go ahead with a test. I do also want to see one other thing. I want to check out our cleanliness of The other good thing about not replacing these touchpads are that touchpads are a pretty important part of what you're doing. And I doubt highly that the aftermarket part is as good as the manufacturer's. So by being able to leave the original on there just gives us an extra... I'm just looking to see what that is. Let's look at that under the microscope. I'm not even going to change views. Yeah, I really do. I think that's just another little booger on there. And I don't mean a human booger, just a dirt booger. And yep, yes it was. We cleaned that off. What I'm doing now is I'm just, while I got this little plastic razor blade, I'm going around these edges of this touchpad. It's because we are keeping the original, but we're going to go ahead and get out some of the gunk from it. It has built up over time.
And no, I'm not doing this under the microscope. I mean, it's not really something anyone needs to see. There's nothing special to this. There is no technique. It's just taking an edge and tracing against the edge of the screen in order to clear out any of that gunk that is built up in its crevices so that we get a cleaner appearance. We're going to wet our lint-free wipe and we're going to use that to then wipe away any excess and that is definitely test ready. What we need to do now is finish our cable connections. Now if for some reason we do not get again not using microscope trying to do this the way everyone else would All right. So can it be done by hand? Absolutely. Hand and eye with no magnification? Absolutely. All right. So we've got all that in, all our cables there connected. We want to put on our back cable here, which goes to our camera and gives us battery support so that we can run a quick test. Then if everything goes well, we will at that point then do our final seal up of this device and it will be ready to deliver back to its owner battery. Again, batteries are not hard to replace. It's definitely something you can do on your own. You just got to take out a couple of screws and give a lift. But you, don't buy batteries from eBay. Nintendo is actually pretty good about selling authentics and replacements to customers. Buy from them. Most of the batteries on eBay are fakes. Or at least buy from a source that you trust that is verified that even if the battery is not made by Nintendo, that it is of quality and that it is rated to work with this device. And is our sleep back on? There we go. Sleep was on, but also the switch had not situated yet. So by using it, it kind of put everything back into alignment, and then I had to put it into the, the use position. Okay, and that appears to be good. I do think that the speed up is just a part of that firmware. I haven't seen it go quite as fast as it did before, but it does speed up a little bit, and the feeling of this feels a little bit less like I don't know, somehow it just didn't feel like it was situated right before. And now it does. So I think we're good. At this point, let's go ahead and do our last step, which is to pop that back back off and put all of our final pun, uh, parts on. Oh, tired. I haven't really done a lot today. So again, I think that's the heat in this room is making me sleepy. Why did it just get hot in here? Check that cable. 
everything looks good. Even I would probably like to have a wider tool than this for that particular one, but it didn't cause any damage. But I checked it afterwards just because the amount of force that it took, I just I didn't like it. I wasn't I wasn't happy with the way that it wanted to, to kind of come together. All right, now these are a little bit tricky, and in fact, I'm going to pull the scope over for this. I mean, we're going to lose that top view here for a moment, but that's okay because we're going to switch to the scope. All right, so what we did was we took this button. See? And oh, you can't really see that. Where is it? So it has these little pivots. And that's what goes down in this. So we're not going to be able to get this spring into position without manipulating it. And that is pretty simple and straightforward. We just do it like that. And that now makes it where this hits that button, see that button, very simple mechanical button, and the spring returns it and makes sure that it's not making contact. We're going to do the same thing to the other side. You can even see on these buttons' edges that there's still more gook on them. Look at how easy that was. It just snaps right in. We want to check and make sure that button is still good. Probably should have checked that beforehand because if it wasn't, that would have to be taken all the way back apart to remove that. All right. So now that that is done, we can go back and actually we need to put in the rest of our screws to our, our uh, board mounts. And look at how messy that is. That's flux that just hides in there. Let's go back to scope, not scope only, logi big only. Trying to remember if any of these. No, that side did not have to be on first. I think I found where one of our pins go. And then realize where both of our pins go. Or maybe not. Maybe it was actually right. Uh huh. That's what it was. They go chomp. All right, so we're going to get all these uh, screws back into the board. Then our screws that go into our controller need to be remounted so that it doesn't want to come loose while it's assembled. I'm just checking to make sure I haven't missed any. Good, good, good. Doesn't go there, doesn't go there. I 
move you there. And so you haven't done a job right until you have screws left over. I've got two screws that I thought went in on the board level, but I don't see holes for those. So what I'm wondering is, did they go to one of these in order to retain it? And I needed to remove it. And now we've got another gook situation, so we're going to clean this part off. Again, it seems that all that is built up where there's fingers involved. So it just furthers the notion that this is, in fact, dead skin cells, oil, things like that. Now you see where this can become a very tedious repair process just for something that seems so simple. Now I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there that you know you just pop it off and pop it back on. That's how you replace a screen. It's it's not that way, people. It usually requires a lot of in between from point A to B. Alright, so we got our pins back in and they go down here and basically what they are is like retaining pins so that if you wanted to hook in a loop, that's what that gives you. So if you ever wonder how manufacturers make that little loop for a cord, that is how they do it. Alright, so now we've put all that back. And now we need to get our cable back in. You know, it's almost like I pulled two screws out of my bum. Because I still have those two screws that I was almost certain went to the board. But there are no open, vacant circles anywhere on this logic board. They have all been sealed with screws. So now I would have to review the video and see where those screws came out of and why I feel like I mixed them up. I know that they came from this device because those are all gold screws. But let's be honest here, two screws people is not going to break the bank. It's not going to affect stability of this device. I don't know what it is. For the most part manufacturers seem to like to cut corners as much as possible to save money on manufacturing. However, when it comes to screws and screwing stuff down and locking it in place, that is where they like to spend a fortune. They will overdo screws to the end of the earth. And I don't know if that's just an engineer thing or what. Maybe there's a guy at Nintendo and at Sony and at Microsoft that they're hired per screw. And so each person has to justify their existing their existence by finding where they can put a screw on the board. That's at least what I like to imagine. But I will actually say that in recent uh, editions, revisions, that's the word I was looking for, of Xbox and PlayStation, 
they've started to do away with a lot of screens. They've gone to retaining screens, and some of it is like PlayStation did this one where they plastic welded joints so that the device can't be opened and resealed. And of course, being repair techs that sometimes have to think outside of the box and come up with ways to thwart manufacturers' methods of thwarting aftermarket repair, we come up with our own unique solutions to that. And we have done that in that case. So it served absolutely no purpose other than, yes, it did allow them to reduce the amount of screws used and potentially um, lower their overall cost. But in the scheme of things, those few screws didn't break the bank. Uh, they, they should have put them back in. They intentionally, in my opinion, made the device non-user serviceable by making it so that if you weren't doing it for a living, you would not spend the time figuring out how to get past that. You would go, oh crap, I can't put those screws back on. And if you've already taken them off, you would say, well, I just screwed myself, or you'd now have to go and take it to a repair shop that can figure out how to fix that load. Probably something else that we should have tested, but with this, it's direct mounted. It should be fine. But it wasn't testable before because we couldn't see the screen and really should have tested to make sure that the what is this? The SD card slot is functional. And one thing I will give a hats off to Nintendo is that they have used standard SD slots, whereas PlayStation made their own proprietary one. And what came of that? A designer decided to make an adapter so that you could use a standard micro SD that would fit into an adapter that then mimicked the size and shape of PlayStation's SD card. Because a 64 gigabyte micro SD card might cost you about 20, 25 bucks. 64 gigabyte Sony SD card. Remember, nothing is different about this SD card other than they made it into a proprietary shape. It will cost you over a hundred dollars. That to me is just manufacturers being, there's no better word for it, being a dick. You're so money hungry that you need to make a ridiculous amount of profit off of an SD card. That was Sony. Nintendo has not done that. Now there's a lot of other things that Nintendo does that are kind of shady on the side of manufacturing. And every manufacturer does this. And, and, and my, if I had to justify it, I would justify it in one way and one way only is that times be tough. You've got a board, you've got board of investors, you've got stockholders, you've got people to answer to. And to do that, you need to make as much money for them as possible. And as long as you're making as much money for them as possible, they're happy. But every year, profits need to increase. They need to get bigger. They need to get better. Nobody wants a company that's stagnant. And I think the problem is, is that we've plat uh, plateaued a bit in electronics. And so manufacturers are having to make some shady decisions in order to maintain profitability and growth in profits. 
And those days are probably numbered because as electronics are becoming more commonplace in the average household, people are becoming more aware of what is good policy and what is bad policy in regards to the electronic devices that they use. This is something that 10 years ago, uh, you talk about this stuff with people and you've blown their minds. They have no clue what you are talking about. That is no longer the case. People are informed now about electronics and they're not as informed as they need to be, but it's getting there. When people start realizing some of the stuff that manufacturers have gotten away with that have resulted in, you know, I've got PlayStation customers that have bought three, four, five PlayStations, not because they got PlayStations in every room of their house, but because they keep breaking. And again, some of this is user error. But most of it is things that probably could have been prevented at the manufacturer's level. Now, again, in their defense, in order to prevent those things at the manufacturer's level, they would have had to increase the price or the sell price of the PS4. And if they did that, I would probably have a lot less work than I have. So thank you, PlayStation. Customers, you know I appreciate you. I hope that none of your stuff breaks, but when it does, I hope you bring it to me to get it repaired. But we have this, this give and take right now in the electronic industry where manufacturers are taking some liberties in order to increase profits. Some of it is needed because they want a price point at a certain level. Some of it is needed because they need you to buy more stuff from them. And no one is bigger in this than the cell phone manufacturing industry. But the gaming console, is, it's got some quirks. They need to start working with repair shops and not fighting against them. We already know that they sell consoles at a loss in the beginning. Now, eventually, they're making a profit. Sony did actually turn a profit off the PS4 from day one, even though it was only a few dollars. But... Your goal should not be to sell people extra consoles. You should be working with companies to make sure that service and support of your consoles is at a local level. Nintendo, you should be doing the same. Manufacturers of cell phones, you should be doing the same. They're trying to hold on to the time of rapid technological advancement where we wanted to buy new products every six months to a year. The gap was that was that wide, and it's not. And it's hard to adjust to that, I guess, when you're talking about billions with a B. A lot of the gaming industry has been able to make its money off of... of um, of its user subscription into online. The downside of that is that most online games are going to use some motivation to, or most offline games are going to have some way that they interact online that you're not going to be able to access unless you pay, either just paying for your Wi-Fi or you're paying for um, PlayStation Plus, which I do. I think it is an excellent value for the money and recommend it to everyone. But they've made great strides in shifting their profit margin of that. So why not work with third parties to make sure the platform that enables your online and, and gaming revenue to grow? Because gamers, if they spent that money on buying a new console, they would have just as easily have spent that money getting their console repaired. And then the difference between the new console price and the repair price they then would go and buy games or more controllers or peripherals or maybe it would have allowed them to save to go the VR route. And I know I'm ranting as I put together these last little parts, but I felt the need to slide that in there. Maybe, who knows, somebody from that, that company one day watches this and goes, you know what, that makes sense. Let's get on board with that bandwagon. 
for cell phone manufacturers, I think the big part that they're missing is, uh, you know, they want to push us into buying a new phone every year. How about after a year's period of the phone when that warranty ends, you have a subscription, whether it be five, ten bucks a month, and that goes towards you continuing to support and upgrade that phone. I, to be honest with you, would probably pay that fee if I knew that my phone was going to last me five years. Because to be honest with you, I don't see enough technological increase for me to care, except for the fact that the lack of firmware support and OS support, so the Android system, like on my, I have a Note 4, it hasn't been updated in who knows how long. It's probably not, I haven't even checked, probably not going to receive any new updates. I got right now a Note 10 for a customer that they would love for me to root it and put a mod on there because Samsung will not do an update to this to allow it to do Netflix and other basic things that are considered a necessity. And this is a device that they sold people not long ago, maybe two, three years ago, this device was bought and the person paid six to eight hundred dollars for it. That's ridiculous. No one would find that acceptable with a Microsoft laptop. Nobody should find it acceptable with an Android. But it is, and for some reason we believe that it's the way that it should operate because we haven't known any different. And we could get into free market and a whole bunch of other stuff, but and say not to regulate. But my one contest to that is that these companies lobby to gain these benefits in the marketplace. They get subsidies at some level. So they're getting a public handout. If they want to give up all of that, then I guess they can do whatever they want. But they lobby to create protections of their industry that prevent competition in order so that they can control the game. And yes, we have protections from monopolies, but try to become a cell phone company and see what happens. You'll, you'll feel like you're being monopolized. <laughs> like you're, you're the outcast that wants in. Try to start a new gaming platform and see how far you get. And that's where I think goodness for things like Steam that have let the indie community kind of grow and develop and become its own underneath its platform. It took somebody as a major player to come in and really support and provide the backbone. And without that, probably a lot of those indie games would not exist. Okay, actually, I don't know where all this just came from. Uh, it looks like just a different backdrop. I could have sworn that was different a moment ago. But look at this. We are golden. We got buttons, we got up down, I've done my rant for the day, I always seem to get onto one before the end of this, and there we go. I don't want to take any pictures and then push them into this person's device, but it looked like I did so anyway, except I probably just took a face down picture. Back. Oh, it's like it changes with every power cycle is what's going on. That's nifty. It looks like I did find a game, so let's give it a play just to show that everything is working and that it's doing what we expect it to do. Plus, who doesn't love Mega Man? I'm showing that I'm a child of the early 80s. And this is what I grew up playing. Cut my hair. Old school music.
Where's our sound at? Oh, we might have something we have to check. I don't know why, but I don't hear sound. But other than that, everything looks good. I don't know if you can. Let's bring this up. So we've got Mega Man, and he moves, he jumps, he shoots. There's the shoot. Works better if I'm not looking at it on an inverted image. Let's go up the ladder. We'll go down the ladder. We go left. We go right. And we jump. And... Ah! I should probably try harder. But I'm not going to. Alright. Let's see. How do we exit out of this game? We hit the home button. And we are going to do now a power off. Oh, wait a minute. We wanted to get into... But well, we know we heard the sound earlier from from the camera flash. Let's go ahead and check sound because I think sound works because it wouldn't have done the flash sound if sound didn't work. Screen brightness is five. Wireless communication is on. Our settings. Where is sound? Okay, suspend that. Software. Uh, you know what? I'm an idiot. There's a volume control button on the side. And when I was flipping it, I pressed it. I slid it down. I can already hear the sound on it. It's not that loud. Let's go back. That was definitely much louder, so I think just that faint background music. Let's go back to home. Here's our home screen. There we go. That sounds better, but let's go ahead and... There we go. That has sound. And there we are. So everything on this now works. Start button, select button, D-pad, well, D-pad, and I forget what they call this, something stick. Uh, A, B, X, Y, start, select, power on, power off. We have our sleep button and our home button and the touch screen. Everything is good to go. So if you needed a video to show you how to do a 2DS screen replacement from start to finish with a rant in between, that is how it's done. That's all for today. I hope you learned something from this video. If you have any questions or comments, put them in the comment section below. If you like the video and want to see more, go ahead and click on that subscribe button. And we will see you on the next video.